All right, so to be honest, I struggled about how to format this a bit because this field, have you heard of this before? Psychophysiology at some point? So it's definitely becoming more popular. It used to be sort of labs across the United States that did biophysiology or exercise psychophysiology, something related to that, biopsychology. Um, but now it's spread into, I think, uh, multiple areas, especially as it relates to exercise especially even more so as it relates to like the sort of recreational exercise or not necessarily in the high elite athlete at this point although that is a big time future in that I believe or how does this work in an obese population or an inactive population so anyway I went back and forth because I didn't want to do like this generic lecture as well uh, because how many are is this all graduate students they are, they are in uh, a smattering of masters and PhD. okay Good. Have y'all got it all figured out yet? Nope. Okay. So now I was thinking back, well, maybe I should take this approach to where I'm going to tell you my story, in short, of how I've come to this point of what I, I think of as a very symbiotic relationship between physiology and psychology. So I have uh, 45 or 40 minutes, whatever, to cover my entire life. So uh, I'm going to try to fit it in as best as I can. All right. Who made this popular? Nike. Does it work? Yes. Okay, we will see. So what I found was that this was my first thought. So when I finished my undergrad here, I always say I was stuck with a kinesi degree because I didn't know what to do with it. So as any young male would do, I moved to Southern California and started training. At that time, it was the world's largest 24-hour fitness in the world off Von Karman. Um, and I had, had a blast. I was there for two or two and a half years. And there were 26 different personal trainers in this location. And so what I would do is I would pay each one for 30 minutes and let them train me. And I started learning and learning and learning and learning. But it started bugging me at that point because um, they were saying different stuff. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start figuring out what's right and what's wrong because you can't tell me that and you can't tell me that because they're an opposite of each other. And so at that point, I got with uh, some folks at Apex Fitness and started kind of doing on the side some training of the trainer. But you know what was the most interesting part was that at that time, coming from wanting to be a coach and then moving into the fitness world, I, I stuck with higher level athletes. Um, and at that time, I, I was really interested in that. Well, a long story short, there was a, a guy I knew who was on MTV's Real World. You, know, you remember that? All right, anyway, yeah, I, don't, I don't promote it. But anyway, he was a um, guest. Like his girlfriend was the main character, and he would show up every now and again. So he and I became kind of, kind of buddies. But he worked for fitness model shoots and so what he would do is he would go to fitness the, sh the photo shoots and he would stand on the side and say like okay you're doing that right now take the picture like their lunge form or whatever and he got paid to go do this and so he couldn't make it one time he asked me to go and I said well sure and so I went and I got paid and then it started opening a few gigs well that turned into me training fitness models which I became very intrigued with um, as, as a young single guy but um, and so I really enjoyed that although I was in my office and women started coming in usually middle age who were not fitness models and said I want to look like all those girls you're training I said well I have no I don't know how, okay, let's try it and so I started trying to train them based on what I knew which was training athletes or fitness models do you think that worked out very well no it did not but what it did was it opened me up to the athletes and the fitness models, to be honest, became less and less interesting to me. I started getting more and more interested in the story of these ladies and what they were trying to do and why they were doing it. It's not that the athletes weren't important. It was just for me personally, things started shifting a bit. And, and, and I don't know, it just became more intriguing. It's, I've always pursued what's the hardest, I think, or the most difficult to understand or what has not been answered. And this was one of those for me because my training didn't really prepare me. Uh, for that. And so that led me to Atlanta, and long story short, and then I pretty much had a mentor out there in Atlanta that said, if you want people to take you seriously, get your PhD. And that was the exact words. And I said, okay, I'll get a PhD. I wanted to get back to Texas, and luckily I talked to Dr. Greenwood. Um, I took the GR really quickly, and if you remember, it was like a few month turnaround. Um, the good Lord was there. I was able to get myself a foot in the door, and um, it was a really great experience for me. I got my master's in about a year and a half. Um, but at that point, 
right before that point, I was in this mindset of just do it. And it was frustrating to me, right? I was like, I need to learn more because I'm telling people to do it, but they're not doing it. And why is that? Why aren't you doing it? It's that easy. Just go exercise. Just eat more vegetables. Like to me, in my, my brain, this was it. And that I couldn't make it happen frustrated me more and more and more. Then I started learning about the causes of death. You know, the CDC puts out the top 10 leading causes of death every year. Uh, in Texas, it's eight of the top 10 in the state, or in the country, seven of the top 10 are chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, et cetera. Th those things are preventable, right? But what we find is what are they preventable by? It's not necessarily drugs, but it's by the particular behaviors that we do. And the ones you've heard about, not smoking, being physically active, eating you know, a healthy diet, a lot of fruits and vegetables, and then maintaining a healthy weight subsequently by physical activity and, and eating healthy. Do you know that those four, the data supports, we could prevent 80% of all chronic disease? North Karelia, Finland, in the past 35 years had done this. They've reduced heart disease by 84% by helping the country get these behaviors and take care of business on that side. So it's pretty phenomenal. Not only do we have estimations, but now we have countries that are doing it. We have parts of the U.S., Northern California, for example, some pockets where they're able to make this happen. So to me, that was crazy, right? That 86% of the healthcare costs in the country go to chronic disease that are preventable, and they're preventable by these four lifestyle factors. Why aren't we putting everything into this? Well, in my world, in Kinesis and y'all's world, we talk about exercise and diet all the time, but where are we talking about it in the way that it would turn around and make an impact on the numbers? So then I looked more. Cancer we could reduce by 60%, heart disease 80%, diabetes by 90%. This is 90% of all cases of diabetes that have been estimated to be prevented if we could just get people to do those four behaviors. Now, I was talking earlier, there is a field called lifestyle medicine. By definition, it's using lifestyle, such as these things, but you could add in stress reduction, sleep, loving others, that has a positive impact on health and well-being. Subsequently, we can prevent, treat, and even reverse certain diseases. If you're aware of Dean Ornish's work or Caldwell Esselstyn's work at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. And so we have now more evidence showing that we can reverse heart disease, which again, we do it with lifestyle, no medicine can do that. So now that perks my interest even more. These folks that I wanna help, and if we help them look at the major public health impact we could have. But my next question was, do we just do it? What do you think? Do you think people are meeting recommendations activity, eating healthy fruit? No. So th if, if they're not, as we'll see, I had to move into why. But before I got there, once I was at Baylor getting my master's, um, part of the confusion really was those first few months. Um, I was in the ESNL and I saw a magazine and a fitness magazine opened it up and it said, it was somebody doing a plank, bows and toes, and it said uh, core stability exercise. And no lie, that same day, I was looking at another magazine in another part of the lab over in Willoughby side, and I picked up another magazine and it said, again, another plank, and it said core strengthening exercise. I was like, it can't be both. You either train for strength or you train for stability. Or what is it, or could it be both? And so it bugged me. And so just a few months into my graduate work, I decided to write a review article uh, on core training and, and look at where we were at that point. And so Dr. Greenwood and I put this final paper together, it was published in a CA journal. We were able to um, kind of get the field moving into stabilizing some confusion related to this. Um, but it would kept coming back to, why don't people just do it? And at that time, I was really blessed to interact with Dr. Rafer Lutz, uh, who kind of pulled me under his wing as an exercise and sports psychologist to help me. I did a, a graduate seminar with him and he threw a bunch of theories at me and gave me weekly readings and I met with him once a week and we started talking through some of the psychological aspects that were completely new to me. He also was kind enough to hear my upside down views on things and for me to come in and say that that theory is that's dumb uh, and him interact with that in an appropriate way. And so I was still learning like it doesn't make sense. So for instance, when I was out in Atlanta, one of the mentors out there, Jim Manessi, was like, dude, you can't, you can't do three sets of 10 reps with a new exerciser. I was like, why not? That's what, that's what the requirement is. You know, right? Or they're training for hypertrophy, eight to 12 reps, something like that, or they want strength, so we drop it down repetition-wise. So you can't do it. 
And again, this was before grad school. So I'm like, well, why not? That's what I've learned to do. He said, if you do it, they're going to leave. They're not going to like the way it feels. They're going to drop out. And I'm like, but if we don't do it, then they don't get the results. He said, what do you want? Do you, would you rather start lower and progress and keep them around? Or would you just want to bombard them with the prescription and they drop out? I was like, well, I don't know. And so he and I went head to head, uh, usually over corn nuggets at the local buffet, because that's what he loved. But uh, so we, we talked about this over and over, over and over and over. And so, it, again, it was like it didn't sit with that just do it side of my brain. And now I'm starting to pick up all these other theories that are trying to help us explain why people don't just do it. And it was incompatible, uh, dissonant, and, and for me, for, for years. And so for my thesis, we looked at uh, self-selected intensity. I started getting into the psychophysiological world. Uh, Dr. Ekakakis at Iowa State was showing that, not showing, but saying that if you let people self-select their own intensity aerobically, they will adhere better. One, we won't really get to talk about today, but people do tend, even in active people, tend to self-select an aerobic intensity that meets minimal guidelines, usually, not everybody, but on average, which is kind of cool, right? So you let somebody go to the gym and say, get on the treadmill, pick a uh, intensity, a speed that you think you should, and they tend to pick something that's, you know, 60 or so percent of their max heart rate, VO2 max, something like that. But did that work with weight training, right? If I let somebody go to the gym and just self-select their own weight, would they stick with it? There were people that were like, yeah, because they self-select. I didn't believe it because I'd seen it all those years that just because they self-select. You know, self and what we ended up seeing was I let this group self-select and to spare you some time. You can see this is the number of participants in the study over six weeks. What do you notice? Several s outcomes that I proposed for my thesis, I was going to look at pre-post that I wasn't able to because we were left with three people after starting with 51. And these were inactive women, have not li lifted a weight in at least two years. Student age, they had to work out in the students' uh, section of the workout facility rec center there at Baylor. So we gave them what they want, you know, pick whatever you want. One of the groups was in free weights, one of the group was in machines, and just to see if there was any difference. We also had some instructional, instructional variation. All but three dropped out. So, that didn't answer my question. So, I had this part of my brain that's just do it. I now had what the medicine was. Be physically active, eat your fruits and vegetables, and then maintain a healthy weight from those behaviors, and don't smoke. That could reduce 80 plus percent of all chronic disease, 90 percent of diabetes. I wanted people to do it, but they weren't. So in a way, I started, okay, I got to take a step back. I know what the pill is, but it's an extremely big pill to swallow. So I started thinking back to all those stories and those interaction with those women when I was trying to transition from fitness models to just everyday middle-aged women who wanted to lose weight and look better for whatever reason. I had a lady that said, look, you're making me come here exercise, which I wasn't, but you're making me come here exercise. It's like you're telling me to put my hand on a stove every day and burn it just a bit to where I don't want to do it, but you're saying that somehow this is going to help me. It's going to reduce my blood pressure. It's going to do, and it's going to heal. And by healing, right, I'm going to adapt and it's going to improve something or another. So the pain associated with the exercise was not pleasant to her. Plus, you start thinking about time. I'm working a job, I'm busy, I got kids at soccer, I got kids here. That's a big pill to swallow. And I know you guys, I'm here, to try to swallow those big amino acid pills or something like that. I know when I used to, I guess I have a small throat. I was like, I'm gonna die every time I take this. I mean, it was my big worry. And so you don't look forward to doing the things that you don't necessarily enjoy, right? And so that started piquing my interest. Subsequently, I started thinking about how do I conceptualize exercise as it relates to pill? Because it's hard enough to get people to take a pill. But now exercise was the medication. Physical activity was the medication. So what if I gave somebody a pill bottle, right? And I said, okay, I want you to take that pill every day, at least five days a week. Okay, fine. Oh, by the way, you're going to have to twist that cap 30 minutes every day just to get to the pill, to take your medicine. And it's not going to be an easy twist, too. Your heart rate's going to get up. You're going to burn. You're probably going to be sore from twisting. Would you all do that? Maybe. Folks are aware of no way. But that's the way they viewed it, right? I had to take myself out of my own just do it mentality and put it into there. Like, how are you thinking? So I started talking to a lot of people, including my mom and family members and a lot of folks like, what do you think exercise? And they're like, it sucks. I don't like it. It doesn't feel great. 
I don't enjoy it. I don't have time. I don't have this. I don't have this. I'm not motivated to do it, which was the complete opposite of what I thought, was the complete opposite of what other people thought. But then I started thinking about it more. I was like, I don't really like weight training, even though that's what I was you know, interested in. I don't, like if I could look, like if I could be massive, like if I could be as big as him and not work out and take a pill. Yeah, that's right. But I could do, you know, just take a pill legally or something and get, and I probably would do that. Like that would be like now with a daughter and another daughter on the way, that's another 30, 40 minutes I could go spend with them. Like I'm gonna take that every day of the week, but I don't because I go work out and it's not necessarily because I enjoy it, but I like the outcomes from it. I like the health, I like the strength, I like the physique, I like staying in shape, I like looking good for my wife. You know, I got all these other benefits, but if I could get that another way, and I was being honest with myself, I might consider that, uh, even though it wasn't the popular answer within my, my world. Then, as I talked to these ladies and talked to these folks, I then started digging into the research about the emotional responses to exercise. And this is what I learned. There is evidence to support that people don't like exercise. They don't like the way it feels. Again, this was different. Remember the no pain, no gain type mentality? This, and so, in this group that I was working with, the actual negative feelings they were experiencing were from the thing that they should have been doing, like physical activity or exercise. So now I'm still within my grad program at Baylor. I was taking Dr. Willoughby's exercise biochemistry class, and we had to do a lit review and a presentation. And so I asked him, at that time I was doing a little side thing at Gold's Gym with, with a group exercise with some women in weight training, and so they would, they would take a dumbbell, right? And what I would do is I'd get them to lift and try to choose the repetition max, the correct amount of weight that would make them stop somewhere between like 10 and 15 reps. And so they'd sit over there and they would lift. And then as soon as it started burning, what'd they do? They stop. It's done, it's too heavy. I was like, well, you, and then you force them, right, to go through that. And they can do it six, 10, 12, sometimes 20 more times. But as soon as it started feeling heavy or it started burning, it stopped. And so I asked Dr. Willoughby if I could do a project where I uh, looked at the biochemical reasons our muscles burn when we lift weights. And if I could, you know, accommodate that. Now it's a biochemical, exercise biochemical explanation for the psychological behavioral issue I was having. So you notice I'm already starting to kind of connect the two and how we can marry the two. This is actually the conclusion statement that I made in that paper. I found it, uh, and I actually found it when I was at SFA because I was grading grad papers and I was wondering if I was being too hard on them. And so I pulled my old grad papers to see if I was uh, worse or better than they were to make sure I was grading fairly. But in finding this, you can see that uh, as you kind of glance through some of this, there were certain things that we thought might have worked. Um, you know, common things that we hear about with lactic acid, um, adenosine came up, um, potassium came up, uh, there were some other things related to prostaglandins and their role potentially. Now this was 10 years ago, about and 19 years ago, but what we're seeing is that look, the psychophysiological effects of exercise induced discomfort may be a valuable tool in altering how professionals address, educate, and prescribe exercise for a growing sedentary and obese population. For me, this was new. I didn't know how much had been going on for how long. We talk about RPE all the time, but I'd never really studied RPE. You know Borg's first name, you know what it was? In case you get it on trivia, Gunner. Gunner Borg, yeah, in case you get it. Yeah, so, and when you look at the early, early, early research related to how people self-select based on how it feels, they were actually pretty good at adjusting things based on the feelings. And so then I started thinking about exercise or streaking, whichever. You get all of this, this physiological response going on during exercise. Heart rate increases, ventilation, there's muscle damage at the systemic level, along with all the receptors that are picking up on this damage, that are picking up on all the, the chemical things that occur that you guys learn about. The brain uh, is, is interpreting this in good or bad ways. Uh, again, some could do, go through an experience so, for example, there were some older studies that were looking at self-efficacy, but in short, what they said was, if you take a uh, middle-aged female, let's say, that's inactive, and you put them on a treadmill, and they're at a certain moderate to vigorous percentage of their VO2 max. Well, they're going, they're going, they're going, and all this stuff starts happening. They start sweating, the heart rate goes up, ventilation increases, their muscles start burning a bit, their brain's starting to 
pick up on the feedback over and over and over. Eventually, if you push them long enough and they bonk, how do they interpret that? An inactive middle-aged woman. I don't like it. That's the generic general response. I don't like this. But if you took a middle-aged female, a woman in this case, who was active, who was fit, put her on the treadmill, same relative intensity, and she started feeling all this, muscles burning, sweating, ventilation, heart rate increasing. She pushes, 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 it gets done. How does she interpret it? Awesome. It's a good workout. The same relative intensity, two different people, two completely different responses, the same physiological production, maybe a little more in the inactive, right? But the same feedback coming up, but the brain is interpreting it in two different ways. So that's pretty intriguing, or to me it was. I knew there were ways to measure this, so I started measuring uh, by this time, I'd kind of moved on to uh, my PhD at the University of Texas, working with John Bartholomew and Phil Stanforth in the Fitness Institute of Texas. And so we had a really a great lab for me, testing facility, because we did tons of testing every single day, and I helped undergrads do the testing and other grad students do the testing. So you can see Ed McCauley's scale here from years ago, 1994 a subjective way of looking at how people feel post-exercise. As you would imagine, with a new exerciser, the hope was that well-being and fatigue uh, could be high, but we wouldn't want them to interpret it this way. And so this was a very unique factor in this process. And so what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to teach you a real quick summary of what we know uh, in how people generally respond to exercise. I'll give you the review article where it tells you this, but I thought it'd be appropriate for a, at least a little teaching moment of, of this uh, seminar. All right, so during this low, kind of mild intensity, so this would be like a 10, 15 minute walk around campus. Just take a break, get up from the desk, go around, come back. You notice that the response during that tends to be positive. The way they do this is with a circumplex model. Have y'all seen this before? All right, so on the horizontal axis is what's called valence. It's like negative to positive. And then the vertical act, act, axis is called activation. So it's like high activation, low activation. And so what you notice is that where they start, during this little task, which is a 15-minute walk on the treadmill, it became a little bit more positive. So it went to the right on the valence and it became a little bit more activated, but not a ton. And so they kind of moved that way and then you can see how it happened or how it changed to post five minute, post 10 minutes. So a little bit positive. But if you move them to moderate to vigorous, okay, what they ended up finding was that it's called inter-individual variability. In other words, some people respond positively and some people respond negatively. For example, the one on the left was 14 people that responded in a uh, negative way. So what I mean by that is from the pre to minute 27, you see how they went a bit negative and the activation went up? But on this group, this 14 people, look how they responded. They went up as well, more activation, but kind of swerved to the positive side. So during moderate to vigorous physical activity, not everybody responds the same. We have inter-individual variability. What about after? Well, it was almost uniformly positive. So then if you do like strenuous exercise or you have somebody doing that, again, a lot of these studies are done on folks who are fairly fit, sometimes inactive, and I'm gonna show you an example of that here in a second. So during strenuous, there's a negative trend in their affect, in their feeling states, until they reach or surpass their functional limit. So functional limit physiologically uh, in these studies is typically like lactate threshold or ventilatory threshold. So why do you think it's not as great feeling at or beyond lactate threshold? What's physiologically going on? That's right. And now you have all this lactate building up, you can't do it. So why would the brain want you to stop at that point? That's right, you just gotta stop. If you keep doing this, you're gonna die. And so we're gonna make you bond. If you see anybody hit the wall when it comes to um, you know, depletion of liver glycogen or things like that, the body, the brain has a mechanism. You know, or you see the people who come in, it's like, surprise, happy birthday, and she just falls on her back and passes out. You know, we have these mechanisms, get you on your back, get blood to the brain. Um, especially when it drops so fast back to the central system with a sympathetic nervous response. So the brain's really, really cool on how it interprets a lot of these things. So this on the left was inactive people on a cycle ergometer. And this was a, uh, they pushed them, as you see on the right was treadmill and active. They pushed them to their ventilatory threshold, which like we do, like an integrated treadmill. And then they kept going until volitional fatigue, until they stopped. 
on their own, like a max test. So you see what happened in both. It just got way more and more and more negative. So it got more negative, but as soon as you pass lactate threshold, ventilatory threshold, what happens? People, it just sucks for, for most people. Now, after you do that, after you do strenuous, vigorous exercise, it's almost an immediate positive shift. So I'm going to show you that same graph, right? So that's where they ended. Look what happens. Immediate to cool down one minute post. See how fast that was? It almost, it didn't get back to where they started, but pretty darn close. Why do you think that is? Potentially, right? There's probably a fit, there's serotonin, there's catecholamines, there's dopamine. Uh, there is a, a theory called an affective contrast theory where a guy in the 50s started looking at paratroopers and how they were scared to death. They would jump out on their first jump, get to the ground and be like giddy, hugging each other, laughing. Like completely personality differences. It's like, yeah, you have this threatening situation and then you get on the tail end of that, like I survived, and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel great. And so we're thinking maybe that happens with vigorous exercise for people who, one, even if they know, this group was active, so they knew how that felt. But if you've done um, exercise testing before, you can know how when you're done, you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's good. That could, in some people, get them to come back, right? But in other people, it could keep them away. And specifically, David Williams at Brown did an awesome study years ago, and it's now been replicated. So in short, what happens is you bring in an adult that's inactive, and you go to get them on a treadmill, let's say, for 30 minutes, moderate intensity. This scale is called the feeling scale. It ranges from minus five through zero to positive five. And so what David asked was he asked them to circle where they were during this 30 minute routine. What they found was that every increment on the scale predicted, significantly predicted how active they were at six months later and at 12 months later. Is that crazy? So one exercise bout with an inactive adult predicted how active they would be tw one year later. And the, the, the theory is that, just like if you had a bad first date, how is it hard to go on the second date? Guys are like, no, girls are like, yeah. Right? But it's, it's difficult because we face our, our sort of perceptions of that, and if I do it again, it's going to feel the same way. Just like the lady sticking her hand on the stove. If that's the way she perceives exercise, it's going to be really hard for me to get her to do that. But this lady over here, if she enjoys exercise, it's going to be easier and easier for her. So it might be the same physiological stuff going on, but how they interpret it is different. And am I, I had asked myself, am I prescribing based on that, or am I just prescribing based on what the book tells me? Reps, sets, volume, you know what I mean? And so um, this pushed me now, since I was dealing with weight loss, into diet. And guess what? We found the same thing. We find that with diet that people don't necessarily enjoy eating healthy as much, or at least relative to eating unhealthy. And so how do you balance that? Uh, and so it's not always about just do it, but as we'll see, it's not only do people do it, but potentially, why don't people do it? Because remember these four factors? 3% of the U.S. population gets all four, and that's probably an optimistic estimate. So we got a long way to go. So now I'm thinking, all right, so why do people do it? So when I started my PhD, that was my big question. Why do people exercise? Why do people eat healthy? Why? And if I figure that out, naively, I was thinking I could just tell people who aren't active, hey, this is why people who are active do it. Just do it for that reason, and voila, you're going to be active the rest of your life. I found it was much more complicated than that. So in my first lit review, in my, my first semester, I started looking at why? The motivations behind exercise and physical activity. I found health was important, but very consistently I found that body image was more important. The number one rated reason why people exercised. All right, so how many in here exercise for body image? At least to some degree. Okay. What's your other main reason? Performance? Health, perhaps? And so um, when I was actually at Baylor, I, I would ask them, why do you do this? And I taught a weight training class. And it was a beginning weight training class. So you're like, why are you doing it? And they say, health. We're doing it for health. I was like, what if you got uglier, but you got healthier? Would you still do it? And we're like, well, no. Well, then there's some other factors here, right? Health might not be your main, your, your main motivator. It might be some body image as well. So, I may have said it was a required course. A required course. I needed the hour. That's right. Or 
Yeah, uh, or Colin Wilburn taught the section and they took it for him or whatever. Uh, but you, you have a, a variation into why people do stuff. But again, we started seeing some consistent things. But here, here's what was tricky for me. It was not only the main motive, but look, what it was also related to in the literature. More distress, higher BMI, disordered eating, smoking, plastic surgery, and avoidance of health care the more disturbed they were about their body, and subsequently, it was a barrier to them exercising. So the same reason they were doing it was acting as a barrier. And so now I'm like, now I'm really intrigued because that doesn't make sense in my brain, right? That the same reason they're doing it is the same thing that's acting for them avoiding healthcare and being a barrier to physical activity. So then you start looking more into it, which I did. And so these two ladies, this was a little task that was done at Daily Mail. And so this is what, what we would see if we saw a picture of them. So what they allowed them to do was edit their picture. And this is what they said they looked like after they were allowed to edit based on their own internal perceptions. Then they asked these two ladies, again, what we would see. Gave them time to edit. And this is what they said they saw. This is what, when they look in the mirror, this is what they see. Oh, sorry, I went fast, didn't I? So then we did DEXA scans. I removed the lungs in Photoshop. But in the Fitness Institute of Texas at, at UT, I was able to do literally thousands of DEXA scans every, it seemed like every year. And so I started asking people, how does that make you feel? So again, we would do our weight, I started a weight loss program there called Get Fit. And so we had pre-post DEXA scans and bring them in. And this actually started at Baylor when we were doing part of the curves research and doing scans and working with, uh, who now is Dr. Travis Harvey. And uh, they would come in and I'd scan them and they would like, some of them would tear up. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, what do you think's wrong? I'm just seeing my body and then in this way. And, it, and so I, I gave hugs and I started, oh, it's gonna be okay. I didn't know what to do. Like pat on, I don't, I don't know what, what do you, I just didn't know, but I became intrigued. At, at Texas, when I was doing these, these ladies are all the same body fat percentage, but their body shapes are different. And what I was seeing is that body shape sometimes made a difference. It was like the body fat percentage didn't, but how I look within that body fat percentage, how, and what I say made a difference, how they reacted. Some were extremely upset. Some were extremely happy. Some were in the middle somewhere. And I was like, oh my gosh, some, I made everything worse. Some, literally, this is when I followed up with them. I was like, all right, so I know how you felt. What did you do when you left? She's like, I didn't eat for four days. Or I started my cleanse, or I did my fad diet, or you know, one lady picked up her old eating disorder because of what I did by just simply doing a common clinical process of saying, this is your weight, this is your BMI, this is what classification you're in. Subsequently, this is your total body fat percentage. That's this many pounds of fat. This means pounds of fat-free mass, et cetera, right? Here's your bone density. But it was producing all these crazy responses, some positive and some negative. So then what I realized, it's not just about body image, but body fat had a very specific role in here that really wasn't looked at as much. And so I started looking into that, and we did it one of my, this was my first successful study. Uh, we did a couple more that just didn't work out. Uh, that we published on looking at the affective or feeling responses to the DEXA. In general, what we found, those who were told they were normal uh, or high body fat percentage, there was a significant decrease in positive feeling states. Just because they found out, their, they saw their image and they had, they kind of poked and prodded a bit, the whole experience. But this is what was interesting. It was only the women and men, in this case, it was undergrad men and women, that were high, were told they were in the overweight obese range that had increase in negative feeling states. And the reason that is important is because there's usually three responses to negative feeling states in this sort of situation. It's to change, try harder, or give up. So in other words, the people who felt higher negative feelings, some of them could have changed what they were doing, which could have meant they, they could have went to a bad eating habit from eating healthy because apparently it wasn't working. Or they could have done the opposite of that. They could, get, they could try harder. I'm gonna add an extra day of exercise per week. Or maybe I'm just going to give up. Again, by the feelings, they're trying to interpret those things. So a major theory that underlies all of my research and all of my now application across the state in public health uh, through AgriLife Extension is this, the theory of self-regulation. So generally speaking, there's a few different definitions, but it's the process of monitoring and changing our behavior when normalcy is interrupted. At the time, I was really interested in normalcy being interrupted. And what I mean by that, if this is normal, 
for someone, their day to day. What I do when I tell them, dude, you got to get off the couch, you got to quit drinking so much beer, you got to quit smoking so much, you got to wear pants around the house, I've interrupted his normalcy. The idea, though, is because I interrupted it, you're going to change your behavior, and before you know it, what? This is going to be normalcy for you. These are the people that maintain healthy lifestyles. For a lot of you guys, this might be normalcy for you. If you go on vacation, you still exercise, right? A lot of times. But for most people, they don't because they're on vacation. So then you look at the actual theory, and this is what it says. Now, I can't spend much time here, but it says, look, everybody has a goal or standard they want to stay up to. There's an input that lets them know, just like a thermostat over there, the standard is 75 degrees, and it's reading input from the room, right? It'll get hotter and hotter in here as we sit here. And subsequently, what will happen is it makes a comparison between those two things. If you have a standard for, you're talking about performance, you have a standard for performance, well, you might work out for a while, but then you do some form of input to see if you're matching up. If it's a weight goal, you have step on the scale, and that's your input, for example. If there is a discrepancy, what I noticed was that there's an affective response, and this theory confirmed that. That look, if you perceive there's a discrepancy, you're going to feel some way. Subsequently, though, the theory said, look, after this affective response, you're going to change your behavior, and then you're going to check that input again, and it's going to be this feedback model that keeps going and going and going until what? That discrepancy is completely gone. This is why you see someone would say, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. They lose 10 pounds, and they stop. Why? Because they, the feedback stopped, because there was no discrepancy anymore. And then they went back to their old way of life until something an input, they, we saw in Austin, we saw people walking down the street and they saw their reflection in one of the mirrors, like the windows of the building. And we're like, oh my gosh. And that would be their input. Then they would think about their goal, or their standard, or the way they should look. And that would spur an emotional response. That would uh, spur their motivation, the change in behavior. They would keep checking, checking, checking until they reduce. And then they'd stop again. And then they'd see themselves again. Or Facebook says, hey, a year ago, this is what you look like. And they're like, oh my gosh. That's what it looked like a year ago, and then it either spurred more positive or negative behavior. And so when you have a successful comparison, what happens is you tend, tend to have positive feelings. And again, this motivates you usually to continue what you're doing because it must be working. If it's unsuccessful, remember I told you earlier, you're going to have negative feelings, and what are your main three responses? Change, try harder, give up. So you can just memorize that forever, change, try harder, give up. So that when you have someone who has negative feelings, then you ha have a, a theoretical perspective now. Like, okay, just because you feel negative, it doesn't mean it's going to be bad, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good. But if I know that your goal now, if you have positive feelings, you're going to have a good mood, and you're going to change in behavior if you want to reduce negative mood, or you're going to maintain a positive mood. So what I learned was that really behavior in a lot of these women, and the, some of the men we were working with, was coping. They didn't love exercise. It had no personal meaning to them. It was just a mechanism for them to improve mood or decrease negative mood. Is that interesting, right? So it was just, again, not the way I saw exercise. So then I was like, well, if I'm going to call it coping, I'm going to change it from behavior to coping. And I'm going to quit calling it behavior. It's, it's just they're choosing it just to cope. Well, the problem with coping is that it's not just exercise. So we could do problem focus where the focus is I'm going to cope in a way. I'm going to fix the problem. And some of you might be that way. If you have a significant other and you have a little spat and you want to fix the problem. And then if they don't talk to you, you get all frustrated because you want to talk it out. You want to fix it. I want to fix it. I want to fix it. Others are like, I don't want to interact. I want to escape away, and I just want to do something to give me good emotions. What in the movies? The guy breaks up with a girl. What does the girl do? I don't know. This was movies in my time. Maybe it's different for your time. Yeah. Food generally, right? Ice cream, broccoli, no. Squash, no. Yeah, maybe for some. But it tends to be that high fat, high sugar food that, again, psychophysiologically, that produces a very strong uh, dopaminergic response to the point where you can get uh, a mouse in a cage and give them the option for sugar water or cocaine uh, for a while. And they have 94% uh, in most studies or higher will choose the sugar water over cocaine. You can take that same mouse, get them addicted to cocaine, and then give them the option of cocaine and sugar water, they'll still choose sugar water. And so the power of the brain in response to this type of food, the flesh's desire for that is very, very, very strong. Subsequently, what I did was I, I drew this out for my dissertation. I took that, that theory 
and I changed it up a bit, and this is what I wanted to test with my dissertation. If the ladies we were working with in our weight loss, what I found was one of the most common standards they had was um, like the old weight, high school, college weight. But then the emotional responses were, were varied. At the top you see kind of avoidance. So I saw ice cream was avoidant at that time, uh, Spanx, that's old corset, or they just throw their scale away. Then this feedback model would stop, which literally is what happened. They would say, I just throw it away. Approach, they could also do problem focused coping. Some would exercise, some would take supplements, ideally producing the results that they wanted. So I did my dissertation and we created a scale to assess these. We saw there were 10 different coping responses at least. We called it the weight cope and it's for you guys to enjoy if you want um, to utilize that. It does interact in a very unique way, all of these, uh, which we don't have time to go into, but there were certain ones that started popping up. So for instance, camouflage uh, was one of these. And we found the reason I put that picture is because uh, we found that wearing big scarves now is a way to disguise the body or the clothes that kind of hang loosely. And that's purposely why they were chosen earrings to distract. Again, this is all new to me. I did learn though that the textile and clothing industry is evil and trick people into buying clothes. Uh, so you could take a dress that is a six, put a five on the label and it'll sell more. And then you take a six, turn it to a five, and you charge more, it'll sell even more. And so now, a six now is, wasn't a six 10, 12, 15, 20 years ago. So they continually change. They even have zeros, I've learned. Do you know that? Size zero, what does that mean? Doesn't make any sense to me, but they exist. There are gonna be negatives maybe in the future. There's also apps now, like Facetune, where you can knock some things out before you post it on Facebook. So I actually had an undergrad student at SFA who wanted to look at this and she's done a survey and she's working on getting this uh, published. But um, it was very interesting to find that camouflaging was a very, very big thing that people did. And this is what was interesting was if I can wear certain clothes or dress in a particular way, do my makeup in a particular way, if I can edit pictures before they go on Facebook, or I can stand a particular way in pictures to make myself appear the way I want to appear, which I learned about the sorority squat that I never knew, knew about before. Um, and so you take these pictures, why, that's what they were saying, like why would I exercise? I don't have to, I'm socially acceptable, I'm meeting all my goals, I'm, all I gotta do is wear that and do this and I'm good, why eat healthy? I can keep eating all the same junk or not exercise. I'm meeting my, my social goals or whatever it might be. And so that makes sense to me. Why would they exercise? Unless they found a reason to do it. Right now, they did not have th their why. They haven't found that yet. And so we started looking at, okay, we got uh, this little situation theoretically to where we have this trigger that makes us think about ourselves, emotional response, coping, and then the outcomes that we might get. So we were checking off, okay, what the coping was, but why? And this is where I'm gonna kind of wrap up. So the first thing I found early in my PhD was that there was the nurture theory, right? That society or the way we were brought up, social influences uh, on our body image, on what we should look like, what we should not look like, what we should do, how we should act, et cetera, right? The social influence nurture. We did a study on this a little bit after, uh, and what, what we ended up finding was that it really, it was there, but it wasn't as, as, as strong like this pressure to look a certain way. It, it might have influenced negative behaviors, but it wasn't influencing and predicting positive behaviors like physical activity and diet. So it's like all the social pressure forced negative behaviors, but not the positive. And, and maybe it could influence positive because we were seeing it, um, but we needed another explanation. And so uh, I took a class in, in evolutionary psychology with David Buss, his doctoral seminar. Uh, there at University of Texas just to kind of see how they were explaining things. Uh, and this, this argument of nature is built around that we have hardwired mechanisms that at one point allowed us to survive when we lived as cavemen and women, but are now being exploited in a particular way in today's environment. For example, David Buss has said that those who fail to mate fail to become ancestors. So mating and looking a particular way to attract uh, a female or a male, depending on what you're looking for, is built around these innate mechanisms. Women who are too easy to attract are perceived as less desirable, and so they've shown this in their research, and so there's a strong motivation in women to look, and again, not all, but the generalized things that they were finding in their lab and beyond across the US and the world that looked at this is that there's a strong 
in short, natural desire uh, in both men and women for physical attractiveness. Whether you agree or disagree, the fact is, is that they were showing it worked. Or, like, you know, for me in our, our faith-based research, it's what the Bible calls the flesh and the desires of the flesh, right? And they just describe it a bit differently. But what we're talking about is these, and you can think about what those are, right? These kind of common desires. Well, so they did studies where they looked at what is the perfect female body according to women versus what is the perfect female body according to men. And you can see how they vary. What's the big variation here? That's right, waist hip ratio, larger breasts, smaller hips, um, or a manageable hip, not too big, not too small. Uh, but then you have nurture come in now with all the rap videos or any videos accentuating the butt. And so you have this argument over here and this and that. So anyway, it's like you're either nature or nurture because then you look at the guys. The perfect male body according to women, the perfect male body according to man. Again, speaking in generalities. Well, how, okay, so I'm thinking, okay, I got this. I got nurture, nature. How does this affect who I'm working with? Well, this study looked at weight loss motivations, and it was in obese women. There were more obese women that are in the pre-contemplative stage, if you've ever heard of that theory. So they weren't willing to change. But they are obese by body fat percentage, but they had more ideal waist tip ratio. So remember I told you back in those DEXA scans, those three women with the same body fat percentage, but the ones with the better ratio tended to respond more positively. So that's what they found here, was that they were responding in a way, and so they weren't as motivated to lose the weight or the fat because they were okay with the way they looked. But it wasn't just that. We looked at it in the lab, and we looked at the role of body fat, and we sure enough found that if you look across all of these body fat, that the most attractive um, tended to be number, number, like around the seven range was the most attractive. Any guesses to who it was? This is all women. At the beginning, at the end, somewhere in the middle? And that's where it tend to, tend to rank. So like this one, you're thinking this one? Yep. Yeah, how did I know it was that one? Because of her. That's right. And so we don't have any facial recognitions. We don't know if she's smart, if she's funny. Right? So there's, there's clearly more to humans than just the way they look. But could people be making decisions, healthy or unhealthy, based on how they looked. Well, conceptually, common sense tells us, yeah, but this is what was really intriguing. And I didn't know I would find this. All right, so this was the perceived attractiveness of other people rating those images, like you guys rating the images. They didn't know what their body fat percentage was, right? like, just like you didn't know just then. But look what happened. So you see this big drop off? Well, this is also the same drop off where we have health risk. So the David Buses, that's what they were saying. The reason is because that person doesn't look as attractive because there's something wrong underlying physiologically, like their health or something like that. So that was their argument. So now another, the way they're reacting based on a potential physiological thing that I never knew about. I was asked to be a part of this worldwide study, global study, where they did that, and they sure enough found the same thing. But the hiccup we found was that, yeah, if you get other people to rate attractiveness, right, if you were to rate the attractive, it tends to correlate pretty strongly with their total fat mass, their waist circumference, their body mass index. But look what happens if the people rated their own attractiveness. It's not as correlated. In other words, you could have a, a woman, in our case, who was optimal body fat percentage and think she was ugly, unattractive. You could have somebody that's high body fat percentage, obese classification, and think she's highly attractive. And you had all this variation, thus the correlation wasn't as strong, which led us to a thing called mate value and the desirability. So a very smart man said, look, it's not necessarily nature versus nurture, right? This whole idea of optimal, what is it? He said it's herringbone. It's the Mary of the two. They're both very important. And so where that led me, and I'll get you to ask some questions so I can, can stop and, um, since we're on, on time. Um, but this pretty much led me, just so you can see where, into the, the why, and this is where I am now. So in other words, and I, I have, we've looked at brain activity, we've looked at executive function, um, which I can show you some of that at any time you wanna see. Uh, we have a lab here on campus in agriculture and life sciences that do uh, brain lab work. Uh, we have found that women respond when you give them information. If you look at their, inact or their subconscious brain activity, they either approach or avoidant and subsequently their consumption of comfort food varies by how that subconscious 
You can actually get people to predict uh, how much they will smoke uh, by their subconscious brain activity. You can predict how active people are going to be based on their subconscious brain activity. At the same time, remember I told you self-regulation? If you picture that as a big gear, your executive capacity of the frontal lobe, if you don't have abilities to attend and inhibit or a problem plan and problem solve, I could give you a food log, but you won't do it because you don't have the capacity. It's not intelligence. It's executive capacity. And so how do we utilize that to in, improve sports performance even? Right? I believe it's one of the next frontiers in sports performance enhancement. One is how do you supplement but do it for their health? I think that's a novel, neat area that needs to expand and not just give it to them to an ergogenic aid, but is it making their health better or worse? And subsequently, or similarly, how, what are things we could do psychologically or through these subconscious activities like biofeedback perhaps, or um, giving people guidance and giving them prescriptions based on where they are. And so I'll end with what we're trying to do now across the state is how do you take a theoretical perspective psychologically, marry it with the physiology and all the cool stuff that's going on that we clearly did not have time to cover tonight with psychophysiology. But that whole story for me has led me to the point is, one, I love the relationship between both. Seems like every day I learn something new. But how do we take that from the lab? And how do we translate that not only to one individual, but for instance, 28 million people across an entire state and beyond? If it's grounded in both psychology and physiology, and the marry of the two instead of the dichotomy, I think we'll be making much more headway than we ever did in the past. And so I hope and encourage you that you found something tonight sort of interesting that one, will change potentially your practice, but two, if you stay in the research world, even if it's on the physiology side, how do you incorporate a little more of the psychology? If you happen to be pursuing the psych, then that's cool, but how do you incorporate the physiology? How do you help explain why the things are going on or why they're not going on? Subsequently, it affects your practice, and I think will impact people in a more positive and a more um, large way if we can marry the two um, together. So I know we're on time. Thank you. If you want to ask me questions now, I'm happy to stay and answering questions, or if you want to ask in front of everybody. Anything? Oh, you don't have to clap. Sorry, I think. <laughs> <laughs>